Hello everyone, welcome to the Geo Ecologist. I am Dr. Krishnanand and you have been watching my videos on various topics of geography, environment and research methodology on my channel, the Geo Ecologist. So if you are new to this channel, consider subscribing our channel and also please go to the playlist to look at the older videos. Now in today's session on regional geography, we are going to talk about the various theories of regional imbalance. Regional disparities, imbalances have been explained by various scholars, various schools of thought, various approaches in different points of time. So in today's session, we are going to look at the collection of such theories like sociological theories, geographical theories, environmental theories and most importantly all the economic theories that tries to explain the theories of regional imbalances across the world, across India. So let's go ahead but before we go ahead don't forget to subscribe to our channel and do share the videos with others as well. So now let's discuss about the various theories of regional imbalances. Now whenever we say regional imbalance, it's important to understand that what constitutes regional imbalance. So it simply means the wide differences in per capita income, literacy rates, health and education services, levels of industrialization and also not in a single region but within as well as between the regions. That is what we say is the regional imbalance. So one region is highly developed and the other region is not so highly developed or low at the levels of development and also at these levels of per capita income and several other factors that we say. So if you observe that regional imbalance is the effect of variations in growth impulses over space. It means what? Growth is non-uniform. Remember we talked about this in growth pole theory and also Schumpeter's analysis that growth is non-uniform over space. So what happens? Because of this non-uniformity of growth, only few centers achieve the levels of desired growth and rest are not. So it means there will be a disparity, there will be a imbalance. So what we say is that it is important geographical search as to why certain regions have higher growth rates while others do not have. What are the reasons? behind it then certain regions have polarization of these economic factors while others do not have they are economically deprived and that is when the birth of several regional development theories regional imbalance theories comes into the picture so if you observe carefully that there is a line of divide between a same region within a same region you'll find some places get more attention while others are lagging behind this kind of disparity is commonly visible over space right so resultant of differential economic force existing in a region is what we say is this regional imbalance so if you want to look into the various theories of regional imbalance remember there are certain heads under which you can study these theories so these heads are environmental theories of regional imbalance, geographical or locational theories of regional imbalance, geopolitical theories, part of geographical theories itself and then you have social theories of regional imbalance and remember regional development mostly is taken over by the people from economics department. So you'll find a lot of economic theory that is also studied under geography. So economic theories have most important values or most important relevance in terms of theories of regional imbalance across. So most dominant view in regional development is the economic view always. Right. So to understand these theories, we also need to consider one thing that is we have not studied till now is the history of economic thought. That is very much important to understand the theories of regional imbalances. That how through history the economic thought process changed and various scholars gave different kinds of thought process and there was a paradigm shift in economic thinking as well over space that led to change in geographical thinking as well. So what you observe is this particular chart here. If you observe carefully from the beginning that is mercantilism that you say the age of trade where you'll find these points very relevant if you observe. You can pause the video and study these points from the slide as well and later on when we publish this slide in the ebook form there you can also get it. So if you observe carefully what you observe is this is the early mercantilism where trade was free flow trade not much of obstruction by any particular institution. So import substitution, economic self-sufficiency, strong political authority, then state would aggressively seek to expand its position and these were important in terms of key industrialization of manufacturing and others. 
which is related to agricultural dominance. Now, the age changed and new theories were physiocrats theory, where government of nature was very important. It means rule of nature, not state involvement. This came to being as economic thought process, where you'll find allowing economy to follow natural order. So natural order in terms of three economic sectors that is proprietary class, productive class, sterile class were discussed in this laissez-faire economy that is leave it alone, let them progress, do not intervene. That is what is the natural or rule of nature. And then comes the capitalistic world where classical school of economics comes with Adam Smith major work and David Ricardo, Thomas Malthus, Baptist Say, J.S. Mill, these scholars come come in 19th century. From 18th to 19th century, the dominance of classical school of economics and classical economic theories. Now, these theory had the importance of what you say is factors of production, labor theory of value and profit maximization, economic man concept dominated. Then if you observe carefully in 19th century, what happened? The rise of socialism, right? The mid of 19th century saw Karl Marx and his influence, the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels and several others, where we see that social and political change and industrial revolution fused together in the concepts, right? So important is capitalists wants profit and for that they will use the available factors of production to their maximum benefit, right? And they don't want to pay maximum wages. They'll pay enough wages that could sustain their money and more profit could be maximized. So there will be a class differential in the society. So this was more of a social theory in 19th century. Then there is a rebirth of classical school called neoclassical economics. And what is this? Here paradox of value. How do we judge the value of the good comes to the picture again from classical economics, right? So you will observe the utilitarian theories coming here, the theory of marginal utility and others. Now, if you go travel further, the Keynesian model comes in 1930s after the world wars or between the world wars, right? So if you observe John Maynard Keynes, his work becomes really important in terms of the damage management. Right. And here we talk about a lot of things that we observe carefully in the Keynesian economics during Great Depression, where solutions were to be found. And the solutions was to be found in terms of various ideas that could change the economic situation. So state played a role again regulating the economy when needed. So state intervention came as an aid to the impact of what we say is depression. Right. And then comes the monetarism again, the monetary policy and also fiscal policy as a key economic management. Remember that. And then you have Milton Friedman, where inflation and several other models that you see income tax, encourage market and also observe carefully reduced role of trade unions in this labor market. So minimize state role in economy and maximize the factors of production and modes of production thought process and let the market control itself price stability. So this was more of money supply, inflation and competitiveness based economic thought process that came later in 20th century. So this is economic thought process. Why did we talk about it? Because economic thought process dealt geographical space and that's where economic geography comes into the picture in regional economics. So if you observe carefully, these theories which were crafted carefully looking at various aspects, some of them were environmentally deterministic theories. It says that who owns or controls natural resources will have more development. This is determinism of the resources in a particular area, right? So it says that natural resources, gifted areas are always having an advancement while other areas will perish. They will not be in the parity. So there is a disparity based on natural resource distribution. This is the first idea of environmental determinism that is used in regional imbalance theories. So for example, northeast of USA is more developed than other parts of USA because it has availability of rich mineral resources. Similarly, Western Europe, then Eastern, then Amazon rainforest, desert of Peru are less developed due to scarcity of resources at the same time. So these are the arguments given in this particular theories. But there is a criticism involved that not everywhere in the world you will find such thing happening. It means there is a possibility. So possibilistic school of thought says that man is an active agent. It doesn't just obey the nature as it gives, right? So for example, India and Africa are underdeveloped in mineral rich areas. 
right and due to less exploitation of resources and technological advancement not just because of availability that's one part then japan is the best example of possibilistic approach where you don't find much of natural resources but more of human resources so that's where these theories were criticized now let's go into the other theories related to this one of them is very famous called resource curse theory now what is this resource curse theory that having resource too much of resource is curse if you don't have the human resource to actually exploit that particular natural resource. That is called resource curse theory. So British economist Richard Otte coined this term resource curse in 1993 in his book and described how the countries rich in mineral resources were unable to use that particular wealth for themselves. Right? They were still controlled by the external factors and most of African countries are ruled by this particular thing. Right? So this is resource curse theory. Then what you have is superficial theory. What is the superficial theory? It's climatic theory of development. It says that temperate regions are very good for economic development, human development, while tropical areas are poor. This is superficial theory based on climatic development, right? So what you observe, the criticism is that not everywhere is the same pattern. It means it's not universal. So northern states in India is more backward than southern states. Then why ha what happens here? Observe subtropical areas is poor, while tropical areas in India are more of developed states. So there you can see one comparison. And that is what is criticism. Then Southeast Asian countries are more developed as compared to some Central Asian countries. This is also criticism of this superficial theory. And then you observe other theories like Israel, Lebanon, Syria. They lie in the same climatic zone. But why Israel is more developed? It means that climate control is not valid everywhere in the same way right then if you observe racial superiority theory now this is that some races are superior to the other races right so whites and non-whites debate that we have been look looking at right so racial superiority of the west and inferiority of the east the orientalism concept that we say is another influence in the various theories of imbalances that we say and it is commonly said that people in the West have an attitude towards life, they are very professional, they are very competent while the other people are not so professional, not so competent and they lack punctuality and this is embedded in their racial inferiority. That's what the debate is. So if you observe the criticism of this is that racial theory was based on a communal approach that labeled one community against the other. Right? We are still looking into this kind of debate, clash of civilizations and several others. Then if you observe, there are several regional development theories in economics. So these theories, if you observe carefully, classical theories of development, if you observe linear stages theory of Rostow's model, structural changes model of Louis theory and empirical patterns, then you observe international dependence model, right? Then you have neoclassical counter-revolution model and several other economic models. Then you have contemporary theories of economic development where endogenous growth theory, that is Romer model, very famous, then approach of multimedia equilibria, big push model, Kremers or ring theory. These are certain theories which are contemporary in the theories of regional imbalance and regional economics coming into the economic perspective. And then we have the theories of regional development specifically to growth pole theory. We have discussed several times. You can go to the playlist of models and theories and there you'll find growth pole theory, Peru's theory, Bodville's theory and several other theories. So these are economic background theories which talks about the theories of development. So let's look into some of their viewpoints. So classical economist view if you observe is the self-equilibrating model. It means there is a pattern of self-equilibrium in the market. Right? So what happens? Classical economists hardly evince any interest in spatial dimension of economic development. They believed that factors, flows, market forces would bring equilibrium automatically. Demand and supply balances each other automatically. That's the classical economist view. Then if you observe the social view, social theory of economy, that is Marxist view comes into the picture where regional disparity is highlighted and it is the characteristic feature of capitalism and is aggravated by rivalry, competition and also maximizing profit motive, the economic man that we say. Then what we have is Peru's model, growth pole theory we have discussed in details. So that you observe that growth is non-inform, it's only at the poles, right? And then if you observe is Mirdal's theory comes in 1960s, Swedish economist Gunnar Mirdal, cumulative causation model and economic theory and underdeveloped regions is his work where he discusses the spread effect and the backwash effect. 
it means that development is spreading and it is backwashing at the same time so remember spread effect refers to all growth induced effect inflow of raw material new technologies demand of agricultural products and also strong forces which are centripetal in nature and cumulative impact of these forces lead to the development of a city of a main area of a country then what happens to the others then gradually there is a backwash from this developed area the technologies flow to the hinterland the services flow to the hinterland and then this is backwash that leads to the development in a longer run but primarily few places are developed so strong spread effect and backwash effect are characteristic features of developing economy according to middle's view then if you observe carefully is the Hirschman view so professor albert Hirschman, he was an american economy professor and remember his work is inter-regional inequality of growth and which is inevitable and remember because of the growth conditions in a particular location so he says that in gradual time the trickling down effect will happen which is very analogous to medals spread effect so gradually the development will trickle down to surroundings right so first development happens at a particular location because of the cumulative factors and then it spreads outwards so gradually you will find the trickling down effect happening and this is commonly where polarized growth is there it means mostly in developing countries it's observable then we have core periphery model of Friedman in 1966 it says that there is a bias in development and some locations are favored especially in developing and third world economies remember there are peripheral areas Areas which are underdeveloped and core areas are developed and that's where you have a polarized system coming in so core and periphery these are the typical models where single centric approach is looking into the picture so if you observe unequal exchange the concentration of economic power technical progress then productive activity at the core emanation of productive innovations from core to periphery these are the characteristic feature typical of a core periphery model and then came the agropolitan development model of Friedman and it is basically looked into a territory which is a bounded space where core is the major metropolitan area and surrounding is the agropolitan area agricultural area so it says that the development should proliferate to these areas and that's where you'll observe the territorial approach of meeting basic needs by john friedman and this is the development that he talked about that agropolitan development is very important to reduce inequality or imbalances of the development that we say so if you observe carefully three conditions are essential to successful agropolitan development what are the three conditions so selective territorial closure communalization of land and water resources and equalization of access to resources right this is very important for agropolitan development then what we observe is the various tools measures indices for regional imbalance so here is a list that was used by many scholars so qualitative tools and indices and quantitative tools look at the list so qualitative is hdi gdi sex ratio life expectancy dependency ratio Issue. then you have demographic characteristics multi poverty index technological achievement index happiness index while quantity is specifically in terms of numbers where per capita income GDP GNP NNP per capita consumption wage rate these calculations have to be done in order to assess the regional imbalance or regional disparity in a particular country in a particular region in a particular location so these tools can be utilized so now when we have discussed about the various theories of regional imbalances in the sessions to come we'll be talking more on different other aspects of regional geography regional development and several related topics so don't go anywhere keep subscribed and also do share the videos amongst your acquaintances and also don't forget to press the like button